Hello, and thank you for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions virtual event, Mastering Productivity in the Digital Era, Leveraging the Gear Up Method for Financial Service Excellence, sponsored by Creatio. My name is Greg Newman, Director of Communications for World Council. Today's webinar features a dynamic presentation designed for financial professionals navigating the complexities of the digital age. It will introduce attendees to the Gear Up Method, a comprehensive approach that enhances productivity and efficiency within financial services. By focusing on goals, evaluate accountability and rewards, Consuela Munoz of Own Your Confidence will offer practical strategies for credit union professionals to optimize their operations, adapt to digital transformations, and achieve excellence in customer service and financial management. Again, today's webinar is sponsored by Creatio, which delivers the freedom to own your end-to-end -end member centric automation and change fast thanks to the power of their no code platform. If any questions come into your mind as you listen to today's webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type them in there. We will ask them of Consuela and also of Eric Hale, Vice President of Sales for Creatio will answer them later in the hour as well. Just a final note, this presentation is being recorded and will also be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. And now without further ado, Consuela Munoz is a leadership and Gallup certified strengths coach. She's a trainer, speaker, and organizer of the C-School, which provides a series of events, mini boot camps, and a leadership program with proven exercises designed to strengthen your confidence. Following a 15 year career at a privately held multinational company employing 13,000 people with $10 billion in sales, she founded Own Your Confidence in 2018. Consuela, thanks for joining us today. The floor is yours. I'm here to show all of you how you can be like Danny Ocean and his 11. Danny Ocean from Ocean's 11. And I have a couple of questions for you guys. So I'd like you to put a one in the chat. If you would like to be in a situation where you know exactly where your team is headed with a project or any situation, and you know exactly how your role plays into achieving that um, result. So put a one in the chat if you would like that. My second question is, if you'd like to be in a situation where you know that your strengths and capabilities align perfectly with the work that you're doing. Put a two in the chat for that. And have you ever been in a situation where you work really hard all day and at the end of the day, you feel like you haven't achieved any major results? Put a three in the chat if that's ever happened for you. So I'm seeing those coming in and I wanna tell you that that is what we're gonna work on today. We wanna look at your productivity and how you can be the best you that you are. So I like to say a million years ago, but um, a while back when I was still in corporate, I was starting a brand new job. So I got the job, I took a week off in between switching roles. And when I came back on day one in my new job, the boss says, you know, I'm so excited that you're here. We're glad to have you on board. Uh, we decided last week while you were gone that instead of having you do benefits, I was coming in as HR, instead of you doing benefits, instead what we want you to do is work on creating a um, an internal um Oh my gosh, I'm blank. An internal learning system, right? An online school for our business unit. So I went away thinking I was going to come back to a certain job, came back to a different job. And as she's explaining the job, she says, not only do I want this to be this online learning community, I want it to have like a real brick and mortar feel. This is something I had not done, was not planning to do, wasn't prepared for. But uh, my idea generator is like, okay, brick and mortar school, how do I, how do I get this to have that feeling? And I'm like, you know what? We should have a mascot. We should have a mascot, right? Every good university has a mascot. And she said, 
yeah, I think that'd be cool. But what would you use and how would that come across? And so I'm like, I don't know, maybe an owl. So she's like, yeah, go ahead and try to work something up with that. So I met with our creative department. I said, we're going to have this online university and it needs to have a brick and mortar feel. So I wanted to have like a really um, strong mascot, you know, logo thing that we can use. So they came back with a, a, a couple of designs for me and I, you know, I had explained what I wanted and I went to show them to my supervisor, my manager, the, the director for our business group. And she looks at them and she's like, Oh, I, I really thought that you were going to have like an owl with like a cap and gown. And I was, I was like, Oh, because to me, a cap and gown is more like preschool, more like kindergarten. And this was an online university. So I had this logo design with this owl with its wings outstretched and its talon showing and its face all. And it's very, um, very much not an owl in a cap and gown. And what was great about this was she said, you're better at this than I am. I will trust your judgment you pick whichever one you think will work best for the university. And I have to tell you in that moment, it felt really amazing that on the very start of this new job, this director is trusting me and recognizes my strengths and what I'm able to do and allows me to do it. Now, in that project, we also had a project manager, a gentleman that was working on this, a great project manager, and she wants um, to have a really good event. So we're going to launch this university at our top 100. So we have all the top 100 managers from across, across the globe coming in person for a meeting and we're gonna launch this university there. So it has to be really well done at this event. We have a small piece that's our part of that. You know, it was a three day event. And so when I went to talk to the project manager, I had all these ideas. I'll talk about, I have like this big idea generator in my brain that's constantly has me going all over the place. And so I show up and, and I'm saying all the things I want to do. And he was like, okay, I'm going to handle all of this. He has this giant project management flow chart on his, on his wall. And he's like, and you can just be in charge of the fun. So now in this case, he wasn't exactly saying, yeah, you're the, you know, you're like, I trust in you. He was just, didn't want to be bothered, but I was still really excited because being in charge of the fun aligns with me really well. So I was really excited about this. So as we knew what we were going to be doing, we we're having this launch, we're launching the university at this top 100 meeting. I went all in on having all the fun things, right? We had backpacks, we had pub style coasters, pens, notebooks, all these things. Since we had a mascot, I also thought, wouldn't it be great if we had someone in a mascot costume running around the event? We did that, and then we decided, wouldn't it be fun if we allowed the top 100 employees to name the mascot? So we had a contest for all the top 100 employees to name that were at the meeting to name the mascot. And we had a big winning ceremony, and um, the VP was there, and anybody who won the contest got to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the VP. Uh, just them to talk about their business or whatever they were going to do. So something really sought after his calendar was hard to get on. And so we're going to do all these things. We have the contest and then we threw in a picture show. So all the top 100 employees got to have their picture taken with the mascot. And we made a video to send out on the email. So why am I telling you all these things? One, they trusted in me to, to bring in all this fun that they wouldn't have otherwise done. And the other thing is the result that we had. We wanted to have a good launch of our online university. I don't know if you've ever been to an online university, but in the past, when our corporate group had launched their online university, they had about 20% of people sign up for it, even in uh, 
to even register in the launch. Because of all the extra we did involving them, engaging all the 100 leaders, getting their picture taken, in being part of the contest, all the things that we did, we had when they went back to their people, when they went back to um, their business area and their people and talked about this launch and how exciting it was and all the gear that they had from it, we had more than 80% of employees in our business group sign up and register for our online university in the first week, 80%. Pretty amazing job, right? That was really well. And not only that, later that year, that was around May, in December, the owner of the company was commenting about our mascot and about the great results that we had. So we had an extraordinary result, more than anyone else had had, because each of us on the team was doing what we do best. And there was trust between the leaders and each team member to get done what needed to get done. So I'm telling you all this to highlight what it can mean for you and your team when everybody's doing what they do best and knows what actions they need to take. So I'm talking a little bit about strengths. So I am a productivity expert. I am also a Gallup certified strengths coach. And as part of that, we look at what are your top leadership strengths. So in case any of you are thinking it's not biceps, no, it is what are your top leadership strengths. And knowing your strengths can really help you in controlling your productivity and being engaged, being engaging as a leader. So this is, um, so to talk about strengths a little bit. So this is from Gallup and the same people that do Gallup polls. They have a leadership assessment. You take the assessment, it's, it's online. You can't cheat on it, which is one of the things I love about it. But the result you get from that is your top leadership strengths. There are 34 strength themes and they fall into four leadership domains. They fall into executing, influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking. So I love if you guys have taken strengths in the past, if you have ever taken that, if you know what your strengths or know what domain, put that in the chat if that's something you've done before. So you have some idea. If you haven't, no worries about it. So these four leadership domains, if you other personality things, you know what those top four things are, but then it goes deeper into your 34 strengths. So some examples might be positivity, uh, futuristic, strategic thinking, relator, achiever, uh, responsibility, uh, maximizer, competition, all these are different kind of strengths. And what's great is going deeper from the domain level down into the strengths. But what's even better than that is the synergy that you have in your top five. There, so if you know your top five and you, you're spread out and you know, I'm, I'm in influencing domain, that's where I lead from. And these are my strengths. So people have a general idea of what that means about what you're capable. But one of the things that's really great with this is even if you share the same strength as someone else, you may use it in a different way. Knowing that and understanding what your strengths are can help you be the most amazing you possible. So a little background on how they came up with this. There's, Gallup has a ton of data and they set out to figure out what made the best leader. So they interviewed a lot of top leaders, I can't remember the number, a lot of top leaders across the US and globally to try and find out what is that one strength that you need to have to be a leader. But what they found instead wasn't a top strength. What they found were these 34 strength themes. And the key to being the best leader, the key to being a great leader was knowing what your strengths were and using them with purpose. That is what makes you a great leader. So it doesn't matter what your strengths are. Any strength that you have, you can be that amazing leader. You just have to know your strengths. Now, the reason we say that, you can imagine if you 
really a really lava leader, you think they're amazing, and you try to mimic them. You want to do the things that that leader does. If you have a different set of strengths, you could see where that wouldn't work because you would be pushing uphill the whole time, trying to be something that you're not, where being who you truly are authentically, leading from where you lead makes it easy. That is where we want to start with when we think about what you want to help the team achieve, what you want your team members to achieve. So again, I'm talking about Danny Ocean, right? In Ocean's Eleven. If you think about that movie at all, when he was looking to hire people, he hired people to do this job. Yes, I realize it's stealing a bunch of money, right? When he hired them to do that job, though, he hired people based on where their strengths were what they would do best for the team. We need someone who can do this for the team. We need someone who can do that for the team. That's what we're talking about at strength. So this is a really valuable thing when thinking about how can our team be as effective and efficient as possible. So a group I was working with, um, this manager sought me out. She had created a new team. She worked in a manufacturing facility and she had brought several individuals up from the manufacturing plant floor. So they were manufacturing plant employees and she brought them into an exempt level where they could be a safety team. They were creating safety. The team was really struggling to get things done. Their productivity wasn't great. There was a lot of frustration, a lot of tension between team members and she didn't know how to fix this. She All the things she knew to try weren't working with the team. And so she was referred to me. So I came in to work with this team. So what we did, we did a 12-week strengths program and we came in, we started the program. She took the program with her, um, her employees, right? They all did it together. And that went a long way to creating that trust um, with these new team members because here she is, she saw a third party independent to come in and help us. She believes in us. She wants to develop us. She wants our team to work really well. So we talked a little bit about the goals that they wanted to achieve. And then we talked about improving each person's strengths. So identifying their strengths and then how can they be stronger and stronger in their strengths. So as we're working through this 12 week program, one of the projects that they were really having trouble with, there were two main projects that were having trouble. And one of them, we had two ladies that drove from executing and one gentleman who drove from strategic thinking and they were all working on this project together. So this project was to create a massive spreadsheet of all the training that everyone in the plant would need from environmental training, safety training, um, government training, transportation training, and then training that they needed to get promoted in, in their jobs. So all different kinds of training. Totally frustrated. They were kind of at each other's throats, things that, you know, arguing, very tense. And as we we're doing this work, they had this realization, this realization that maybe if we switched roles, this would work better. So they had the gentleman who's strategic thinking. So he's strategic thinking is thinking about all the possible ways we could do things. What is the best path? Like very much idea generating and executing. Those folks are the ones that want to get things done. They're getting it done and they want to get it done. And they had him working in Excel on the spreadsheet and he'd get started and then he'd have a new idea and maybe we should do this and maybe we should do that. And then the ladies who were, were executing were frustrated that he was taking so long to, to execute the Excel uh, spreadsheet. So they had this realization. And because the manager had sought help, they went in and felt comfortable going to the manager and having a discussion with her about how they felt that they were doing the wrong roles for their strengths this is my strength, these are their strengths, we feel like we should switch roles. 
very uh, big step for them to take, a very bold conversation to have with a brand new manager. And yet they went in and had this conversation because she was also in the training and could recognize that. She said, okay, let's try this. But I, as the manager, have the right to have you switch roles back if I feel like it's not working. So there was a lot of trust between each other and they switched roles. And let me tell you guys, something magical happened. When they switched roles, all the tension went away. They were no longer frustrated with each other because they were each able to do what they did best in that, that task, in that situation. So as they did that, he would have this idea or that idea, and he'd go to the ladies that were making the chart, and they'd say, well, we can do this, but we can't do it that way, or we could do this. How else could you think to do that? So as they were doing the completing the chart, he would have this idea or that idea, how they could get the information, how they could get the data. And they worked so well together that they were able to, one, finish the project early. It had been in danger of being completed behind schedule. It was finished early. And still to this day, years later, they are still using this chart to keep track of everybody's training. They had an amazing result for switching roles. And the manager was more than happy with the results she was getting based on her team working together. So they became so much more effective and productive as they worked in what they did best. The other example, they had a gentleman who was all strategic thinking. All top five of his strengths were strategic thinking. As part of the what they were trying to do, they have a um, automated vehicle that drives up and down the plant floor and it kept breaking down and uh, that was costing millions of dollars. So they needed to improve the breakdown rate to less than 10%. So he needed to go out into the plant and collect data from each of the different uh, you know, plant areas, each of the different business areas. And as he was doing that, he wasn't getting the data he needed. He had input, which is a strength that needs a lot of data. He needs a lot of data coming in. And those people on the floor uh, were having trouble getting that data to him. So when we came in, what we had them do, what I had them do is look at how can we have somebody who has more relationship building skills going out into the floor to get that information and bring it back to him to create the solution instead of having him going out to get the, the data. So part of the issue with him being so high in strategic thinking, he was not high in relationship building. So that wasn't a good area for it. Was, it was a struggle for him to relate to other people. And because he didn't relate to the other people, they were not giving that data. So when they sent someone else out to get that data, bringing the data back to him, he was able to come up with this amazing result. They worked better that way and they were able to get a result of having less than 5% breakdown error. So they went from really bad to almost perfect because somebody else went to get the data. So a lot of times when we assign things, when we want to get work done, we think this is the person to do it because they've been here or they should be doing this and you want to stretch people. But it's much better to stretch people where they're already amazing to have them be great than to worry about someone isn't able to do something, how can we stretch them in that area? It doesn't work as well. These are the things that we looked at that made that team more effective, more productive. Now, I said I would talk about the gear method, so we wanna do that. And this is the time, this is what you guys, you need to get your team in gear, get yourself in gear, um, really get things done. So the gear method is goals, evaluate, accountability and rewards. So when we look at goals and we think about the strengths that we have and what that we want to do, setting your goal, it has to be something you really, really want to achieve for you to achieve it. A lot of times someone else is setting your goal. So we could say, well, if someone else set my goal, that's why it's a problem for me, but we want to get around that. If someone's setting your goal or you're setting your goal, how are you making sure that that goal, when you read it, you have a strong 
positive emotional response when you read that goal. It's something you want so badly because when you want to achieve something so badly, you will. The number one reason that people don't achieve goals is because someone else has set that and they don't feel tied to it. So we want to get that time. So if you think back to our example, you think back to Danny and his 11, their goal was to, um, to heist, to do a heist and steal the money from the vault of the casino. A lot of money, you guys. It was something like $164 million they wanted to steal from this vault. This was also something that had never been done before. And there were many that believed this was impossible, but they really wanted it. Now, as part of that, they trusted Danny, that he had a good plan, and they all wanted this goal. If you've seen the movie at all, you know that most of the people on the team also had some secondary goals, some goals just for themselves, some personal goals that they also wanted to achieve by working in this project. But they all came together and started owning that goal. That goal itself was really important to each and every one of them for whatever reason they made it important to themselves. That's what you want to do with that goal. You want your goal to be something. So if someone is setting the goal for you, let's say that's the example, they're setting the goal for you. How can you make sure that that goal is important to you? You look at that goal. What do you get? Why is that important to you? So I know, so you've heard like ask why five times, right? You've heard the five whys, but to me, it's a why and a what. So ask yourself with the goal that they've set for you, why is that important for you? And what will you get if you achieve it? And do that again. Why is that important? So if you say, this is, this is important to me because I will get this. Why is that important? And what will you get from that? And continue to ask yourself the why and what until you feel it, until that goal is so important to you. Because distractions are everywhere, you guys. All the things we can do all the time are there. And when it gets tough, because it always does, when you're trying to achieve something amazing, it gets tough. How are you going to keep motivated on those tough days? And the answer is easy. You own that goal. It's important to you. And it's more important than any of the distractions that could possibly get in the way. So, now our next point, the E, every, or evaluate. And I say every, it's evaluate every idea. So a lot of times um, when we're working, no matter what you're doing, you're bombarded with all different kinds of things you could do, all these different ideas. Maybe I should do this, or maybe we need this, or this software, this training, or all the different things that we could do. Maybe we should try this aspect. You know, Maybe we should add in AI, maybe we should use this all the things that we're bombarded to do. And the next thing you know, we've wandered away from the goal. So I wanna share a quote with you from Warren Buffett. And he said, the difference between successful people and really successful people is that really successful people say no to almost everything. And that's what you need to be looking at when you're being bombarded with those distractions. So I have a method that I use that's called action distraction. It's kind of nice, it's a little rhymy, right? Action distraction. So if you have the goal for what your team is trying to achieve and you are having these ideas come at you, maybe we should do this, maybe we should do that. Sometimes they even come from someone above you to say, hey, have you thought of this? You need to evaluate that idea, that thought, that possibility against your goal. If it's going to help you achieve your goal, that can be an action. But if it's something, even if it's a brilliant idea and it's really amazing, and I don't know about you guys, but all my ideas are definitely brilliant, right? They're very brilliant. So even if it's a brilliant idea, if it's not going to help you with your goal right now, if it's gonna take a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort, it's, it's not exactly related. It's not going to help you with your goal right now. That's a distraction. 
and we're not going to touch it. We can save it. We can save it and say, is an action distraction. You can, you know, create a whiteboard action distraction. It's a distraction. You can store it. But once you've stored it there, you no longer have to think about it. It doesn't get any mental energy. It doesn't get any money. It doesn't get any time. And when it's the right time, it can move from distraction to action. But for now, it's in distraction. And by doing that, by pulling it out and storing it there, you can stay clear on what your goal is and stay clear on the actions you need to take to achieve that goal and not get lost in any of those distractions, helping you to reach your goal faster and with less stress. The next piece of this is accountability. Accountability. If you've ever been in an accountability situation where it wasn't a lot of fun, there was a lot of, you know, it turned into an excuse fest. Oh, I didn't get this done for this reason. And everybody is not getting things done week after week. If you've ever been in that situation, put a yes in the chat. Or if you've been in a situation where accountability is something that hasn't worked really well, you can put a yes in the chat. The thing is, I hate to break it all to you, but accountability, there's no one that can hold you accountable. No one else that can hold you accountable. Who can hold you accountable? You. You are the person that holds you accountable. Now, can you be in an accountability situation? Yes. But the way that you do the accountability goes all the way back to that goal again. Everything comes back to that goal. We think about accountability. It's ownership. You have to own that goal. It has to be so important to you, again, that you won't be distracted. And on the hard days, you'll do the thing. If we think back to the movie, right? They all own that goal, even though they had the secondary goals that they wanted to achieve for themselves. Like Danny, you know, wanted to, to win, woo his um, ex-wife back, right? That's a personal goal that he had, but with the overall goal still being there. On the days that it's tough, you need to own that. The other thing you want to do is you want to commit. You want to commit to that goal and the actions you need to take to get that. So a lot of times we focus on the result. I've been talking about results. We've had amazing results and we talk about that. But what I want to bring your attention to is actions. So first I'll share a quote. This is from Confucius. He says, when it's obvious that goals cannot be reached, don't change the goal, change the action steps. So a lot of times when people are thinking about goals, the goals that they have, a lot of times goals themselves are even actions that they need to take and not necessarily the goals. Now in the Oceans movie, they had two weeks to get this goal achieved. What I want to talk about is 12 weeks. And for the gear method, we operate on the 12 week year framework. You may or may not have heard of this. But 12 week year framework is really when you're looking at there are 12 months in a calendar year and there are 12 weeks in a 12 week year. So each week is like a month, which means that each day is really important and it helps you think about time in a different way. But the other thing we want to do is bring that focus to the actions and not the results. When we focus on results, we can get really tense and really stressed about what is the result? I'm not getting the result, I'm not getting the result. And we put so much pressure on ourselves that it can become unhealthy and it can stall us from getting the result. So what we wanna do with the actions is take that pressure off because at the end of the day, you cannot control a result, but you can control the actions you take. And each and every day, you need to take the actions that are gonna get you the result that you want. So we look at what is the result you want? What is that goal that's really important to you, that result? And then what are the most important actions that we need to take? Because a lot of times we'll show up and we have all these actions, like I have to get all these things done. But do we? Can we? Most likely not. So what are the most important actions I need to take that'll achieve that result, that'll get that goal for me? and narrow it down to those actions and know that you can do other actions as well, but these top actions, five or less actions 
I have to do, whether it's daily or weekly, however often, whatever frequency you set those actions for, set those and do those. Those are the things that you have to do and bring all the, all the effort and all the thoughts on the actions, knowing that the results will happen for themselves. If you think in the movie, that's what they're doing. Everybody had actions they needed to take. You can have two kinds of attitudes, right? And then you saw in that, that attitude of they're counting on me. I need to do this. This is what I do best. And so you're, th you're thinking in the spot. And even if something hits a rough spot and it's not working, it's, there's a snag and this won't work the way I planned it. Having that can do attitude, attitude versus a can't like, oh, I need to get this done. How can I change the action? How can I change the action so I can do this? How can I get this done? That's what you want to do when you're focused on the actions. That's what you will do. And then your results will happen. And then the last thing we want to think about is rewards. And what I love about rewards is people get very excited. Yes, we want rewards. People want rewards. But what I've really found over the years is that while people want rewards, they don't always spend them. They don't always take advantage of the reward. If you have a coupon in, in on your person that you haven't spent, that's a reward that you didn't spend. So people want rewards. How do we make sure that they are using them in the right way and spending them and also motivating? So again, align back to the goal. How do you align the reward that you get back to the goal you're trying to achieve? So I'll think, I'll toss out a personal goal versus a work goal. So if you had, let's say a weight loss goal, you want to lose 10 pounds in the 12 week year, personal goal. Most of us can, you know, associate with at some point wanting to, you know, melt away some pounds, right? So if that's your goal, what does the reward look like for that? If the reward for melting away 10 pounds is to eat an entire chocolate cake, that's not very aligned, right? If you're trying to melt away pounds, you don't want to eat a whole cake because now you're starting over, right? We don't want that. So how can you align the reward to the goal? So in this case, it was to get a new uh, blouse, a new dress. It was to get a new piece of clothing that fit your new frame that aligns with the goal. That's how we want to look at rewards. And you can see that in the movie as well. So I've talked to you guys about this gear method and all the things that we need to do. We need to set that goal really important. Again, you may not be setting the goal. How can, how can you take the goal that you have and make sure you've tied it to you? And then evaluate all the things that you have to do against that goal before you decide yes. And I'll tell you, most of the things that you have are going to be distractions. And so we've got goal, so getting gear, right? Goal is gear, evaluate, accountability, and rewards. So we, we've tied that in, we've evaluated everything, coming back to the accountability, because I know it's everybody's favorite thing. And if you haven't used the 12 week year, it's a brilliant way to think about time in a different way. And I know for me, because I, distractions, distractions, I should do this, I can do this, you know, scope creep, all the things. So how do I do this? Another way to think about that accountability and thinking about the time in a different way. Have you ever, um, you know, you're going along the year and you have X, Y, Z is your goal by the end of the year and November hits and you're like, oh my gosh, I said I would do X, Y, Z and I'm not even close. What am I going to do? And what do you do? You kind of drop everything and you're like, I'm not going to do this. I, you know, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I really have to focus and you drop everything and you really get in there and boom, by the end of the year, you've achieved X, Y, Z. Great. But where was that focus all year long, right? You really only spent a good month really focused on it. Another example might be if you've ever going to take a week vacation or take a vacation, let's say you're going to take Friday off. So you're working and in order for you to get Friday vacation, you have to get all your work done by Thursday. If you've ever been in that situation, you can put like a 
put a, a smiley face or a yes in the chat, right? If you've ever been in the situation where I want Friday off, so I have to get all my work done by Thursday. And magically, you can get all five days worth of work in four days. How does that happen, right? How does that happen? It happens because you're like, well, I want vacation. Like that's something you really want. You want that day off, right? Everybody wants that day of vacation. So how do I make sure that I get everything done? You, you let go of some things. You bring your focus in like, nope, I'm not doing that thing because I'm going to do this. You know, I'm not going to go to this, this or that because I need to get this done. I'm going to really focus. So that focus, how do we bring that focus into your work on a regular basis, not a week at a time, not at the end of the year? That's what the 12-week year can do for you. Now, tying this back into your strengths, when we think about how we are going to bring in our focus and align our things for our goals, knowing our strengths can help us in the way that we word our goal in the way that we we say what we want to get done in the way that we look at the actions that we want to do if you know that you drive from relationship building you're going to want to have actions that help you meet with other people to achieve what you want if you lead from executing you're going to want to be really focused and maybe have a lot of charts that help you get done knowing yourself helps you use the actions that are going to be the most impactful because you want to pick actions that if you do nothing else but those actions, you will achieve the goal. And that's what we want to do. Now, I'm almost done and we are going to have some questions here. But I did want to ask all of you, if you're still in here, if you could give me some feedback on how my talk is. I really want to be able to take this talk and improve my, my mission is to get this message to as many people as possible. And I'd love it if you could help me by letting me know what really was great about the talk that you want to see more of and what was not so great about the talk that I can do less of so it can be even more impactful to other people. So for that, I have a quick survey. It's less than two minutes. If you guys wanted to I'll fill that out. It's a link. You can do this now or later, but it's to less than two minutes. The code word is talk. And I'd love to get some feedback from all of you. And if you want more information about what I do, you can connect with me there. But before I, I end and I'm, I just want to close and tie it back all into the movie to really get this point home. When you want to be achieving amazing things because face it we all do we want to achieve big things if you are a leader you want to be that engaging inspiring leader that everyone trusts that's who you want to be so how do you do that by knowing your own strengths and leading from them authentically but even more than that knowing the strengths of everybody on your team and letting each person do what they do best to help the team understanding how you can use that information when you're looking at goals to assign who's going to do what, who's going to do what role. So if you think about, you think about Danny Ocean, right? He hired this person for this role and this person for this role. And every one of them trusted him and the plan and knew that they could achieve the goal because he portrayed that they could achieve it. Even though it seemed near impossible, they could achieve it if they each did what they did best and trusted each other. They had to trust themselves. They had to trust him. And they had to trust each team member to be where they would say they would be when they needed them to be there in order for them to pull all the difficult things off. That's what you want as a leader. That's what you want as part of a team. You want to be operating from what you do best. Knowing the goal is really important for the whole team, but why it's important for you taking the actions you need to, the can-do actions like, yes, no matter what, I need this. I'm going to figure out a way to make it happen. And then knowing that at the end, that reward will be there. The result itself is an amazing reward, but taking the actions, having that frequency, that consistency to take the actions to achieve that reward and that result, that is how work is fun and engaging and amazing. That's how the magic happens. That how your team is going to be excelling each and every day. And everyone will want to be a part of your team because your team trusts each other and knows what to get done. And Swayla, thanks. You know, 
well, I wrote this down. I've never heard this quote before, but boy, I love it. Uh, it's the truly successful people. I think this is what you said. The truly successful people know how to say no the majority of the time. I, I think that's so undervalued because I've had people say to me, I respect that you can, that you don't like take, you know, people ask you to do these side projects. And I always say, well, it's because I have certain priorities that my boss wants done and that's going to be the focus. And I do think a lot of people get distracted by that, but I, I think that's just a great message. And do you see so many people who just can't say no? I do. And, and again, the strengths can pay a factor in that. When you know your strengths, it's easier to say yes or no. Like there's going to be lots of people that are, you know, there are people that are either volunteers or they're not, and they'll say yes for everything. Right. And then they get into trouble because they're doing all these things. I see, especially if people have responsibility responsibility folks are like, get it done, get it, get it done. And as they get things done, people are like, oh, she's really responsible. You should ask her to do it. Right. So then she gets more things she has to do. And as she gets more things she has to do, then she's saying yes to too many things. And now she's like, I can't even get my own stuff done because I'm saying yes to too many things. So having that confidence and knowing what you should be doing and not doing, because when you know your strengths, you're not going to say yes to something that doesn't work for you. Cause it won't, cause you'll just be frustrated. They'll be frustrated. That'll be a lose, lose. We don't want that. So having the confidence in your strengths and knowing specifically what your goal is always coming back to the goal makes it so much easier for people to say, no, 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 I'm not doing those things. It won't help me right now. Maybe later, but not now it can be considered at another time. And if it's a big project, it definitely can't be considered until the next 12 week year at the first. We're not, we're not adding anything. Once we've set the plan, which the new, 12 week year starts on April 1st. Once you've set the plan for that, nothing new big gets added because that's not how we're going to roll. That's how we get that focus in and achieve what we want. Well, I want to bring in Eric Hale. Eric, if you're there, uh, this virtual event, as we mentioned, is sponsored by Creatio. Eric is the vice president of sales for Creatio. And Eric, I just want to get your thoughts. What did you hear in this presentation that resonated most with you? Yeah, first of all, Consuela, I mean, it was an amazing, uh, amazing discussion. I think it gave a lot of insight to how, um, you know, decisions, you know, need to be made across multiple types of organization. And I think um, my biggest takeaway is to have the uh, the goal in mind, right? And then you work back, um, you know, from that goal, because, um, you know, as we look at, you know, different projects or, or, or different things with any type of organization, decisions aren't made in a vacuum today, right? Everybody has uh, a collaborative, uh, you know, team and efforts that they're bringing all kinds of great ideas, but what that can lead to is, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis, right? Where do we even get started in this? You know, we're starting to debate what, um, you know, what should come first, but when you have that end goal in mind and you're able to work back from that, um, you'll see those steps and the the the, the plan, um, you know, kind of lays itself out, right? Like you'll have, where do we get started? How do we get better? And then how do we get ahead uh, with this plan? So I think, um, you know, in, in, in our world here at Creatio, you know, that's how we uh, create great partnerships with our customers because we don't want to understand, you know, your project or, you know, how our uh, solutions can help you. We, we want to understand, you know, what is your business's end goal that you're trying to accomplish and will, um, you know, work accordingly with you to uh, to achieve that goal. So by, you know, reaching our hand out and lending a hand to meet that goal first before, you know, talking business on our side uh, is our approach to working with our customers. So definitely resonated um, with me. And I think um, the, the audience should, you know, take that home with them as well as they're trying to make decisions. Yeah, and we do want to everything make sure goes we back to the goal. Yep. Sorry, Greg. No, no, I just want to say we do want to make sure if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A for Consuela or Eric. Oh, go ahead, Consuela. I didn't mean to cut yeah, you Yeah, I just there. I think a lot of times people can underestimate the importance of that goal. Right. Oh, here's the goal we're going to here's what we're trying to do, especially if people are in that annualized thinking like this is the thing we want to achieve for the year. What ends up happening with that is it's more like objectives. These are the things we want to achieve versus that like really specific goal. This is what we want to do. And everything has to align back to that. But words matter, right? And so that's why I adjust each each person should adjust the goal to why it's important to them using words that matter to them. You know, at one point I was saying, oh, I make these things. But when I switched the word to create, oh, 
that resonates in a different way. I love that way I feel when I think about creating something versus making something. So even a, a switch of a word can make it more impactful for you to give you that positive response. So take the time when you're given a goal to tie it to yourself. Each person has to figure out why they, what they're doing and what they do best is going to help achieve that goal and why it's important to them. Question from uh, Marcia who asks, or Marcia who asks, in an office-based scenario, who is responsible for the rewards aspect of the gear method? So each office may or may not do their own thing. For me, what I recommend is you having your own reward system. Each and every person can have their own reward system, right? If we go back to the chocolate cake, obviously you shouldn't eat a whole cake. If you're trying to melt away a pound, you shouldn't do that. But what my reward for myself was doing this. That doesn't mean that the office can't also have rewards, that they want to reward people as well. But each person should seek to have some way to reward themselves. And one of the things also that I didn't really stress in the presentation is not only having a reward for achieving the result. Yes, if you achieve the result, part of that is a reward itself. But how are you going to reward yourself for taking action? Because that's where we want the focus. We want the focus on the action. So how are you going to reward yourself for taking the action? So if I have a daily action and I need to take this daily action every day, right? It's seven days a week. If I do that, at the end of the week, what is my reward to myself? So for me, I have a very active imagination and an idea generator, which can get me distracted into trouble. But my reward is if I take my daily actions that I'm supposed to take all week, I get one hour of squirrely time where I get to just let my idea generator go. That's a reward I give to myself. So each person can create their own reward for themselves. Doesn't have to cost any money. Um, could be time, whatever it is. And then the office itself, if they want to do a reward, they can look at that as well. But really find a way to reward yourself for taking action. We've got a couple questions about switching roles that you talked about. Um, Bishnu and Triza both ask about this. Um, first, how do you change the mindset for switching the role at the time you're misunderstanding others? Sorry, can you say it again? I can. I can't hear. Well, you. yeah. The question is how to change the mindset for switching the role at the time of misunderstanding others. I hope I, I'm not sure if that's clear to you. So. This, this is a thing about strengths. So this is one of the things, you know, they were in my Strengths Unleashed program, right? Which is a 12 week program to really develop their strengths and understand them and grow them. Part of that training is how do you talk about your strengths? Cause it's hard, face it y'all. And I can see you're not nodding cause I can't see you, but I know that you're nodding with me about how hard it can be to brag on yourself that this is what I do best. That can be a daunting thing to say, well, I'm really good at this and I don't want to do this. And you're not going to show up to your manager and be like, I don't do this very well. So don't you, that's not going to work. Nobody's going to be happy with that. So instead, how can you have a way of talking about your strengths that benefits the entire team as well as yourself? In their case, they were all going through it together. They all had the language. The manager was also going through the training, understood what they were talking about. So having that shared language of strengths, that's one way. But even if you don't have that, how can you talk about your strengths in a way that's going to help the team first and then how it's going to help yourself? What can you volunteer? So there's a, there's a myth out there that if the, the team needs help, you should offer your help no matter what. And that's a myth because the, the, and, and most people believe like, oh, if the team needs help, I should say, yes, I'm going to do it. But as we talked about, you don't want to do that. You want to say yes, if it's something that you do well, because that's how it's going to benefit the team. If there is a role open and you want to volunteer for it and you're not good at that thing, did that help the team? It didn't because they're counting on you and you don't, you don't do it well. So you let them down and you let you down. But if you volunteer for the things that you do well. Now, again, this is a volunteer situation, but if you want to have that conversation, again, think about how is it going to help the team for me to give what I do best versus what is not my best? 
and frame it that way versus like, I don't want to do that because it's not my strength. That's not going to work. Uh, Teresa asks, in the process of switching roles, what happens if it doesn't work the way you expect it? Do you go back to the previous roles? I think that's a conversation. You have a conversation about why it's not working, what didn't work about it, and see if you're going back or if you're looking at another way that they could do this. A lot of times when we have a task in front of us or we're shown how to do something, we kind of go into uh, doing it how we're shown or that default mode. This is how things need to get done. But I always say with your strengths, it's time to take just one step back and look at what are the results you're trying to achieve. What are your strengths and how do you use them? How do you use them versus how somebody else would use them? Then figure out what actions you'll take to achieve the result. Because so many times, let, let's say I lead from influencing. I'm not sure if either of you know where you, let's say, Greg, you lead from executing and you show up and say, okay, Consuela, I'm going to show you how to do this task. And here's your checklist of 25 things you need to get done. And then the result will happen. And me, I don't lead from executing. I don't have executing in my top five. I'm lead from influencing. I'm going to look at your list of 25 and be like, like that, it's not going to work for me. I am just going to be miserable. I'm going to struggle. It's going to be awful. So instead it's saying, Greg, I like your, I like your chart and your 25 things. However, what is the result we're trying to achieve? And with the result you're trying to achieve, would you be okay if I went about it doing this way? So it's not even always changing a role. It's just looking at how do you want to, to achieve it? How do you want to achieve it versus that default way you think you want to do it or the way somebody else has figured out how to do it that works for them. Taking that moment to pause and think about how do my strengths do that? And I want to say a funny fact about strengths. So the thing about strengths are, again, that top four, 34 themes, you get your top five, they work in synergy. The chance of somebody having the same top five strengths of you in the same order is one in 330 million people. It has not happened yet. So the way that you use those strengths together is going to be different than anybody else in the entire world. You knowing how your strengths work together, that synergy between your top five, that is so powerful because that is the best of you. When people talk about superpowers or the thing. That is how you are most authentic and are going to achieve whatever you set out to achieve, knowing that and using that with purpose. We only got a few minutes left, Eric. I just want to give you a chance to, I, I don't know if anything that was asked in the Q&A, uh, if, if it's about rewards, it's about roles that 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 you have seen as a leader and that, that Creatio uh, puts into practice. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, yeah, some of uh, what um, Consuela was just, uh, just mentioning, like there's going to be different types of strengths that people will have, right? Like if you're leading from an execution uh, standpoint versus an influencer, I think it's also... Uh, very important to learn how to communicate between these these strengths and these styles, right? Like so, under I'm 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 on that execution side where I'm a bullet point guy, right? I just want the bullet points. I don't want to discuss things. I just want to execute. And um, but you know there are people on the team that might be influencers that you know kind of want to talk about things um, conceptually. So we did a lot of work around you know how do you communicate between these different styles. So um, one's not better than the other. You know it's just different ways that you have to look at things and learn to uh, to communicate with each other um, and operate um, you know as a as a team versus you know trying to drive a particular style down on somebody else. Everybody has their strengths, and it's just a matter of how do you communicate that with each other? So that's something that we execute here at Creatio. Well, I love that because that that is the most important thing. And understanding that your strengths is, is sometimes they're so natural to you, you don't realize other people don't think that way. Mm -hmm. And so you can be like, no, this is the way to go. And they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So having that conversation and being able to talk about strengths gives people a lot of grace. Like, oh, I get why you want all these bullet points. Okay, for you, I'll do bullet points because I know that that makes our relationship better, that I give you what you want and you give me the conceptual, the vision, because that's what I want. And so understanding that goes a long way to dissipating all that frustration and tension because you're on the same page. Agreed. Well, I want to thank both of you. We've only got about a minute left. So thank you both. Consuela, great presentation. I personally took a lot out of it too. And Eric, thank you so much for sponsoring today's event. 
And once again, we do want to thank Creatio. You can learn more about their no-code automation platform at creatio.com, C-R-E-A-T-I-O.com. And if you like this event and want to watch it again or you would like others to see it, you can refer them to the World Council YouTube channel at youtube.com slash woku. I saw somebody say they missed the first half. It's going to be there uh, available there later today. Don't forget, too, if you want to participate in more in-person learning like this, be sure to sign up for the 2024 World Credit Union Conference. It's going to be held in Boston from July 21st to the 24th. Early bird pricing registration, registration is still available until April 12th at wcuc.org. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great day.